Stay hungry, stay foolish. Somewhere along the way, we got distracted. As much as we multitask, love our devices, feel like we're in control, deep down, we know that something is off. Shortened attention spans, declines in critical thinking, lack of sleep, self-doubt are just some of the aspects coming to light in the age of digital distraction. It's time to reclaim our lives. It's time to take control. LifeScale is a journey of self-discovery and growth. It's about getting back into balance and remastering our destinies. Our guest today knows this firsthand. He struggled with distraction and all of its ill effects. To get his life back, he developed a set of techniques, exercises, and thought experiments designed to tame the chaos and positively and productively navigate our day-to-day lives. Instead of falling victim to never-ending cycles of news feeds, likes, addictive apps, and boredom scrolling, we can learn to manage our time and inspire our lives in a way that will bring meaning back without sacrificing the benefits that our devices bring. We welcome author of LifeScale, How to Live a More Creative, Productive, and Happy Life, Brian Solis. Welcome to the show. Hello, hello. Quite the introduction there. Thank you. Absolutely. I'm out of breath after that, man. It's a fantastic book, Brian. I love what you did with the graphics, the presentation of it. You thought about how we absorb information these days. But let's start with the idea of realize. You start this chapter with a beautiful quote by Carl Jung. Your vision will become clear only when you can look into your own heart. Who looks outside dreams, who looks inside awakes. I think this is a beautiful way to start the show. It was the perfect quote to start the book. The book itself is a journey, not just my journey, but a journey that I invite anyone to come along on in that this is all so new. Even though smartphones have been with us for the better part of, what, 12 years now? And social media, my goodness, goes, depending on which genre of social media you want to go back to, I mean, mainstream really started to kick off in 2006, 2007. And by mainstream, I mean the mass population around the world. These are things that have been slowly but inevitably changing us, rewiring us, reprogramming us, uh, and not always for the better. I mean, look, as a hopeless optimist and as a technologist, I've, I've helped launch a lot of these companies and helped steer and advise them toward growth and also advised companies and, and countries and organizations and individuals, you know, how best to use these technologies in ways to maximize connections and communications and build communities and foster relationships digitally. So as a hopeless optimist, I was the first to be surprised that I learned I was affected by how I lived my digital lifestyle, how these things were changing me. But it wasn't it wasn't evident at first. It's not like I woke up one day and said, yo, you know, I really should re-examine my relationship with all of these things. It was just a slow, eventual transformation in me that affected how I think, how I work, how I feel. And it wasn't until I tried to write what would have been my next book, which is, you know, this is my eighth book. The other seven were all about business transformation, the future, technology. And so I was on that path to write a similar book. But just notice that my depth, my tendency to constantly multitask, to succumb to notifications, just notice that I couldn't dive deep, that I couldn't focus the way that I had to in this context, right? And those contexts are few and far between when I write a book, which is you know only once every couple of years, or when I write research, and that's maybe once or twice a year. Uh, so you know, I'm sure in, in hindsight, if I were to benchmark my performance in each one of those over the years, I would have noticed a difference. I just wasn't paying attention to it at that level. It was just about getting across you know, the, the finish line. And... I just was struggling so so greatly that the realization, and this is where the book begins, was examining the things in our life that may or may not be noticed on a day-to-day basis. Uh, and so the first part of the journey is essentially awareness. It's, a, it's understanding of all of these things that are happening to us that we don't even know. It's a very proactive 
uh, or a very enlightening phase of the life scale journey to just recognize the extent to which all of this stuff is happening to us. And look, it's not like people are going to pick up the book and say, you know, I've, I've been feeling distracted or I, I've been feeling, and if they do, this is great. But for the most part, it's, it's, uh, it's something that we have to kind of learn together. And then lastly, the, the thing, the thing that was so powerful about this was, you know, even as I was going through hitting the wall and reflecting on the challenges that I was having, it's not like I could Google solutions. It's the, the solutions at the time were few and far between, and they weren't even really solutions. They were mostly anecdotes treating the symptoms. So for example, turn off your notifications, uh, build a stronger regimen in, in, in terms of habits, uh, try digital detox, delete certain things off of your phone, um, you know, disciplinary uh, things. But what what we didn't get to, at least at a professional, thorough, tested level, was understanding exactly what was happening to us as a result of all of these technologies, and then putting together the types of solutions and a path that would address those. Uh, because it turns out that the solution is actually very human. We changed as a result, and we are changing as a result of our relationship with technology. And to do anything about it, it's not necessarily about going back to the way things were. It can also be about realizing that with technology, we could be even greater or more creative or happier, but we just have to take control of it and use it in a very intentional way. So this is really about a personal transformation for each and every one of us to put us in a better position to live a more productive, happier and creative life. And I love that, Brian, about the book, because you talk about how you were writing a different book and you ended up writing this book. And often people say what you're buying into when you're buying art or a piece of art is you're buying the transformation of the artist from point A to point B. And that's very much the case. And it comes across in this book because you have been a digital evangelist for such a long period of time. What comes across here is the more human skills that are necessary in this world of digital adoption. And one thing that really struck me was how many, many people are struggling with the pace of change and digitization. And one of the problems in there is that it's not just that they have more on their plate, but they're not dealing well enough with what's on their plate. And you quantify how much time we use with digital distraction. Well, absolutely. I had to. And part of that is in my work, I study all kinds of technology, whether it's enterprise technology that's enabling a new generation of business or operation, uh, whether it's technology that's transforming societies, you know, in, in, in by in, you know, individual level or in context as customers or as teachers or parents and, and, and children. So you can, when you look at the world in a variety, through a variety of very specific lenses, you can see exactly what's happening. Uh, but most of the time we don't apply those lenses to ourselves. And that is, look, as a digital anthropologist as well, I mean, I've been studying this stuff for a really long time, which is ironic that I would find myself affected. Um, but that's the challenge of all of this. It's not, it's not anything that we realize because the change wasn't sudden. It, it was slow, but gradual. And it changed us and what we prioritize and how we live and how we work and how we think. It's accelerating every aspect of our of our bodies and our brains it's why we multitask all the time and we think it's a superpower it's one of the reasons why we have a thousand tabs open because we can't finish anything the way we used to we have to jump around uh but also it's it has it, it takes its toll it affects our short-term memory our long-term memory it's uh, the chemicals that are flying around in our body as a result of all of this stuff and when you get a like or a notification and how you feel in those moments those are all designed uh, it's it's called persuasive design. So it's how we are and how we behave as a function of the, the, des the design techniques that went into these devices and these apps and these games. And they were very much intended on getting more and more of your attention because that's the currency in which they exchange. And that that's 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 what is that's what created such a sense of urgency. One to fix my life, and yeah, I love how you put it in terms of the. Uh, the metamorphosis of, of artistry, but also I realized that there's just this massive, massive issue all around the world where people don't realize 
that they have been affected and they're living life as if it's not a pandemic, that this is all normal because in many ways it is normal, but it affects everything in how you live, how you study, how you learn, how you teach, how you love, your friendships, your relationships. That's the part that motivates me the most is that we're literally watching society implode uh, for, for all of the wrong reasons. And this is why as you go through the journey later and later in the book, essentially what we're doing is we're recentering who we are, who we want to be, what's important to us, and then going on a path that the technology with or without technology, at least it's giving you a sense of vision and motivation to understand that the path you were on and the path that you are now on were indeed very different in hindsight, but at least now you have the foresight to move in, a, in a, any given direction. So that gives you such a, a much more mindful and intentional way of how you use technology from there on out. The real tragedy is that in this world where we need our full cognitive capacity, you know, we're competing more and more against AI and automation, and not only for our careers, but to solve the big human challenges that are not only coming down the line, but upon us today, we are actually dumbing ourselves down by not being able to think critically. And this is one of the reasons I think your book is so important. It's one of the things also that we don't realize. You know, nobody wants to believe that they're not the best that they can be or the best of who they are. So you see, for example, in the expressions of how people live life across m multiple different platforms, they're all sort of aspiring to be this greater self or they're talking about the momentary uh, joys or experiences they have in life or where they are or what they're doing. And it all looks so wonderful. But exactly what's happening behind the scenes is that that becomes sort of the moment of which we actually weren't in fully uh, or the behaviors in which in between those posts show that we're actually consuming the moments of others and not fully actually in the moment. Uh, go to any restaurant, go to any train station and just observe how many people are not observing life, uh, living life through the smaller screen. And look, it, it's all fine and good. I don't want to be the, uh, the person who's yelling, get off my lawn. But what I do want to let people understand is, or help people understand is that those behaviors are actually taking away from things like depth, creativity, true originality and individuality, the artistry of expression, the artistry of observation, all of the things that actually make you unique, that make you stand out in all that you do. And more importantly, the gift of attention, the gift of presence. If you're with someone, the best gift you can give them is your self, your attention, your energy. You know? And the best gift they can give you is that in return. Anything else is just distracted living and that distracted living has been going on for over a decade and it is why we have issues in politics it's why we have issues in school it's why we probably have children and adults of all life backgrounds probably being falsely diagnosed with adhd or any other false observations in the sense that all of this is essentially because we've been rewired intentionally it's been exposed there's uh, tristan harris who's one of the, the more famous engineers who's the whistleblower in the tech industry is showing exactly what's happening and it's only continued. You mentioned AI and machine learning. Now those things are starting to essentially monitor the patterns of our behaviors and helping to find new ways to juice us and get our attention. There was a Netflix shareholder meeting where the CEO Reed Hastings was asked about top competition and he said it was sleep <laughs> and, that, and that they were winning. And he's exactly right. If you think about Netflix, Facebook, your favorite games, you know, Fortnite, whatever it is, all of those things trade on the same commodity, which is your attention and time. And the more of that they have, the more of that they, they can monetize. But the less of it that you actually get in return, you're actually paying for it. And you feel that you're rewarded in those moments with the false gods of attention from other people, validation. But it's also tearing away at things like self-esteem, confidence, happiness, uh, you know, promise. It's, it's incredible how much this has been hidden. It's like the things that we took so long to figure out, like smoking or sugar, for example, anything that has had a way of being masked or hidden because it wasn't in the best interests of 
the companies that were selling these services to you or giving you these services. And there's a line in the book that I love. We started consuming more than we were creating. We traded expression and imagination for scrolls and swipes. We were intoxicated by the blurring lines between the physical and the digital. And I think that's a beautiful way to kind of phrase it. But this book is about solutions and your work is about solutions. So I'd love if you told our audience a little bit about the work you do and what the life scale process is. The life scale process in, 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 in its whole is essentially giving you back control of who you are and where you want to go. And it's a beautiful journey. It's a hard journey. It's one that I had to undertake. And it was hard for me because I had to pretty much stop my life. In fact, I ended up switching careers as a result of the transformation process and putting myself in a path where I ultimately want to be as well, instead of just sort of keeping up and trying to keep up with the to-do lists and the inboxes and everything that we kind of get caught up in because we're spending so much time consuming versus creating. So the journey, as you get deeper into the book, is one where personal transformation becomes the goal. You're taking little steps and deep steps around reconnecting with your values, reconnecting with your sense of purpose, um, visualizing you know, what it is that you want in life and where it is that you want to go in life now and over time. And these things aren't new concepts, right? I mean, and there's a million self-help books out there that kind of go through these different exercises in their own unique ways. But the difference here is that you're rewiring the rewiring that's taking place inside of your brain and your body, you know, the chemistry, the biology and the, uh, the neuroscience of all of this is essentially the book was designed to, to apply the same persuasive design approaches into positively changing your life. So it's not, it's not, it's not as much about self-help as it is about intentionally reprogramming you in a way that gives you the ability to then start to dictate the next steps that you take and you go deeper and deeper and deeper as you go along. That's the magical part of all of this. That's the story also behind the visualization, the page design, the sketchbook sort of feel that you have as you turn each page is that it's taking a much more positive form of the negative design techniques to help you and make you feel better and help you retain what you learn so you're not having to read the same page 30 times and you know, kind of make you feel like you can get through the book faster, but also to revisit it again because of the experience that you have. So that, you know, in, in, in an overall sort of form, the journey itself, the science behind it is you're rewiring your brain and your body without even knowing it. And you talk about one of the top ways to start this is to rekindle and rekindle our creativity. I'd love if you shared a little bit about how we can do this. Creativity is the catalyst of this book. One, because creativity is directly linked to happiness and creativity is also directly linked to accelerating transformation. It gives you a deeper sense of purpose, but it also gives you an underlying sense of individuality and originality, especially in an era of AI and machine learning that's coming you know, for jobs that we're, you know, we're hearing all in, about. You know, so you don't want to be someone who can be automated, and I, I hate to say it that way, but you want to be uniquely you. And uniquely you isn't sharing a pose or a picture or a filter that everybody else feels that that is the original them. It's okay that you express yourself that way, but it's really more about understanding the unique value you bring to the world. And so when I talk about creativity, it's also one of the biggest pillars of innovation itself. But it doesn't mean you have to be Picasso or it doesn't mean you even have to be Steve Jobs. There's big C creativity and there's little C creativity and even just the slight expressions of artistry outside of the things that you're doing today help change the way your synapses fire. It changes the way your brain operates. And it also changes the way you feel as you're sort of giving yourself this room and space to create or think differently or sing horribly or draw. It's something that no one will recognize. <laughs> but giving yourself those times, those creative sprints to do things that you're not doing today. And over time, the creative exercises that you go through give you the strength and even the confidence and eventually the talent to do more things. It is a superpower and it is something that allows you to not just smile, but it's contagious and other people notice it as well.
I noticed one of the things you talked about there, you said big C, little c, creativity, and you talk about the big H, small H, happiness trap that most of us fall into. And I love the question you suggest we ask ourselves, who would die for us? And most of us would say our parents, yet we're perversely put our happiness in society's hands, in strangers' hands. It's profoundly true and incredibly overlooked. If you think about how much we place how we feel about ourselves in the hands of others. And so it's one of the things that has been designed into a lot of these apps and services, which is they want you to share more and they want you to share more in order to get that sensation of getting more. You look at the different chemicals that are happening in those exchanges. It's not unlike the microdosing that you might see with any kind of substance abuse, right? Because it makes you feel good in the moment because those are exactly the, the chemicals that are releasing your body in those moments. And so your body starts to become dependent on it. And so you share more to get more. And those feelings are what happiness masquerades as. It's not true happiness. It's this trap. And only you can make yourself happy. And the thing about it is that and I learned this, and it's in the book, that happiness is now. You have it inside of you right now. And it's not some journey that I'll be happy when. You know, it gets us into the trap of stuff. Or uh, it's one of the reasons why you keep hearing that people don't want stuff. People want experiences. It's, it's to live happiness now and to give yourself the space and freedom to, to do that now and not to ascribe to the standards of success that have been around for generations and generations and the trophies or assets that we're supposed to have in our garage or on our shelves or where we live or what we wear those things if they give you happiness fantastic but that's not what happiness is about happiness is inside of you and that's what we're trying to connect with and creativity has a way of unlocking that in really magical way and you say this i love this that happiness is a way of life it's not a destination ever but one of the ways we need to define our happiness is, is to understand our values. And values comes up quite a bit on the show, Brian. But I'd love if you take us through the value discovery exercise you do in the book, even at a high level. The reason that values is in this book, and I'm not an expert on values. I wasn't an expert in any of this. It was just a solution I needed to find that it ultimately became a book because that solution wasn't out there for other people who might be experiencing life my way or just experience life in general. So values came up because what happens when, especially connecting the dots between our last point about happiness and big H and little h happiness and the happiness trap, what happens is that the more you live life that way, your standards of happiness and success start to change. It's one of the reasons why people are have or having self-esteem and anxiety issues without necessarily re realizing it because they feel sort of inferior to the lives that other people are living and hence others then want to try to live that life as well to get that happiness or that at least that glimpse of happiness or the uh, visualization of it. What happens though is the more you do that, the more your values actually change, your center of reference starts to move away from where it was and move in directions that change how you make decisions about what's in your best interests and also in the best interests of those around you. So values and resetting those values and finding out what's important to you and then going through it and really finding out what's important to you so you're not just placating the process or saying the things that you would want to say. It's actually about realizing how far you've changed uh, and how much you've changed and recentering yourself so that you're getting reconnected to the values that you want to base your life on. The same is true with purpose and the same is true with the mission and the visualization and the action plan that you put together on all of these things. It was life-changing to realize just how far my center of reference had evolved and I was making decisions that were horrible. They were horrible for me. They were horrible for my family uh, and my relationships and friendships, but they didn't feel like it. They felt like at the time that they were the right things to do. But in hindsight and going through this exercise, I have many regrets and can now see what I had done and how I had changed and 
now on a path and a life scale journey to do things that are important to me because I now know where I am and who I am and where I'm trying to go. As a reader of your book and a listener of your content, I want to thank you because you helped me as well. I'm in the midst of writing a book and you helped me recalibrate and realize that I wasn't being as purposeful and focused as I could be. So your struggle has yielded some fruit and I want to thank you for that. Brian, you mentioned that you have started a new business and it's one of the reasons our show is a little bit shorter today because you're in the midst of that business. I'd love if you shared a little bit about that and where people can find you, maybe to hire you for keynotes, for consultation, maybe even to find out about your books. Yes, thank you. Thank you for that opportunity. And thank you, everybody, for listening and coming along the journey. The, the life scale journey is a, a, a much more personal side of my work and something that I needed to do. It's just it's something I needed to do. It's something I hope can help you as well. I started for the first time, my goodness, in many, many years, an independent research business. So I'm a digital analyst and anthropologist. And so I study in, in, in a professional capacity how technology is changing business, markets, what have you. So I advise businesses, I conduct market research, I talk to executives, uh, teams, and then I'm also a keynote speaker and try to speak about innovation and disruption and our role in not letting it disrupt us, but taking a productive and proactive role in, in helping audiences understand how to lead the way to the future. And from there, you know, I have seven other books that talk about how the future is playing out and, and the role we can play in it. Uh, and anything that you need to know about me, and I invite you to come visit briansolis.com. It's all there. Or at Brian Solis across some of the social platforms that you might use. But I look forward to connecting. And Brian, one last question. If you had a moment to reach everybody in the world with one message, what would that be? There's two things that are happening right now. Disruption is a gift. It's either going to happen to you or because of you. And just like the future, the future is going to happen to you or because of you. And this is a time where we can take a much more, not just a proactive role, but a, an inspiring role, an influential role in allowing ourselves to see where we are and giving us ourselves the gift to see things differently, to move in new directions and hopefully inspire and influence others to follow. Beautiful way to finish. Author of Life Scale: How to Live a More Creative, Productive, and Happy Life, Brian Solis. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much, Aiden. Thank you, everybody.